I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. I appreciate Jen letting me come and, and do this. Uh, yesterday afternoon when I found out I was going to be doing it. Uh, I am not Sean Newell. He is probably a much more interesting speaker, and I hope he gets to come speak to you, but uh, he was not able to make it. That's who was scheduled today. But I'm excited about it, and I never turn down the opportunity to talk about business and entrepreneurship. That's really what I like. So hopefully you can get something out of it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of my a background. So Jen mentioned I'm an attorney. I practice law in North Ogden, Utah. I have a, a practice there. I do a lot of contracts, a lot of real estate, a lot of business transactions, so a lot of uh, business-related contracts, formation, entity, that type of stuff. But that's not what I'm here to talk to you about today, not necessarily the law practice. Prior to accepting a position here as a professor at Salt Lake Community College, I owned a company and I, I owned a company, we called it Nelson Enterprises LLC, but we operated under a lot of DBAs. Anybody you know what a DBA is? Doing business as, it's a name, business name. So we had a lot of different business names. So to, to kind of make it simpler, I just call it Nelson Enterprises LLC because that was the parent company. But what we did is we were an educational training firm. And uh, to kind of make that make a little bit more sense, we helped people get specialty certifications for jobs, or things they just wanted. Things like food handlers permits, uh, first aid, safety, that type of stuff. Uh, concealed firearm permits, armed security guard licenses, that type of stuff. Stuff that you have to go take a class to obtain, but it's not necessarily a degree. So you're not coming to a college to obtain it, but it's a, a class ranging anywhere, usually from one day to three days. That's the type of stuff we would help people do. And we did it a lot. Uh, in 2014, when we sold our company, we were operating in 50, uh, 57 different retail locations across the country, 17 different states each month, and we enrolled about 20 to 25,000 students in our classes. So we were doing a lot of students in these uh, certification classes. And uh, what happened is, in 2014, we were approached by an out-of-state investment group based out of Ohio who expressed interest in purchasing our company. And so they made us an offer, and we accepted, and we sold the company in August of 2014. And that's what freed me up to take the position here at Salt Lake Community College. This is what I really want to do. I really want to teach. And so uh, I was pretty excited about that, and obviously selling the company was fantastic, and that's kind of what every small business owner hopes for. You hope to grow your business to the point where somebody with more money than you will come in and offer you money and buy your company. And so that's what I was able to do, and I'm very, very glad about that. Now. That's the happy ending, right? That's the, that's the end of the story. But what I want to talk to you about is the beginning of the story. So how did it all begin? So nine years ago, I was a college student. I was uh, just about to get my associate's degree at Weber State University. I am engaged to my high school sweetheart. We're about to get married. I'm 23 years old at that time. And uh, everything's going great. I was working at Wells Fargo Bank. I was a personal banker. I was making $12.50 an hour, which was awesome. I was working full time, I was going to college, I was paying my way through college, everything was going very great. I just bought a townhouse and life was great. I uh, actually got a job offer from a different bank, a competing bank, to be a branch manager. So right at the same time I was going to get married, I was going to get this job at 23 years old, be a branch manager at a bank, and man, everything was awesome. So I go on my honeymoon, I get married, go on my honeymoon to Cabo. Cabo's great. While we're there, I spent my last, I remember very vividly, spent my last $150 that I had in my bank account on my wife swimming with the dolphins. She always wanted to swim with the dolphins like her dream. And so we swiped the card, and I thought, okay, this is the end of it. After that, we're not going to be able to buy anything. I couldn't swim with the dolphins. Only she could because we didn't have enough money. Uh, night before we come home from our honeymoon, we get a call. I get a call on my cell phone from a Dr. Antabaka at Huntsman Cancer Institute. My wife had gone in and got a biopsy on her leg before we'd left, and uh, they tell us that she has cancer, right? So she's got what they thought at the time was stage three melanoma, which is a big deal. We find this out the night before we fly home from our honeymoon. So we fly home from our honeymoon, and the next day she's scheduled to go into surgery uh, to remove lymph nodes and kind of test how far the cancer is spread. Obviously a shock. I'd quit my job at Wells Fargo. We don't have insurance, right, because I'm transitioning to a new job. I think it's okay, you know. Even though we just spent our last $150, we have no money in the bank account, I've got this new job. I'm going to be starting at this other bank. Everything's going to be great. 
Same day I get home from the honeymoon, same day that my wife's going in for her surgery, I go into the new job, and they say, didn't you get our messages? I said, no, it was on my honeymoon. What messages? Oh, we offered the position to somebody else. I'm sorry. I said, no, nope, no, you didn't. You offered the position to me. Uh, this is my job. I got to come to work. This is my position. No, I'm sorry. We offered it to somebody else. And so I find out I don't have a job, have no money in the bank, and uh, my wife has cancer. Right? So a pretty big kick in the teeth. Now, at the same time this is going on, uh, my brother, who's been an attorney, he's 10 years older than me. He's my oldest brother. He's been an attorney in Utah for 10 years at the time. Uh, he finds out he's getting laid off from his firm. He has five kids. Right? So this is all happening at the exact same time, kind of this whole spiral into the abyss uh, that, that we've got going on. So I'm starting to think, what am I going to do? How am I going to do? I got bills. I got a car payment. I'm going to school. I got a wife, got a lot of medical bills, now what am I going to do? And how does the quote go? How does the old saying go? Necessity is the mother of what? Invention, invention right? So necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, I have to figure out a way to survive. And a lot, of, a lot of you might have been in situations like this, or you'll be in situations like this. So what are you going to do to survive? Another great quote that I love, Winston Churchill said, uh, success is walking from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. So what I did is I got with my brother, my brother's named Jason, and we sat down and we said, okay, life is kicking us in the teeth right now. What are we going to do? And we started to think of ways that we could make a living. Uh, we came up with this idea. He said to me, you know, I went and got my concealed firearm permit a couple weeks ago. The guy that taught the class was just, didn't know what he was doing. It wasn't a very professional class. I bet we could do that better. And I said, you know, I went and got first aid certified. I went to a guy's basement, paid him, can't remember what I paid him, 100 bucks or whatever it was. His kids are running all over. And I said, we could probably do that better too. And we started thinking, you know, there's a lot of different certifications people pay money to obtain that we could teach. We like teaching that we could teach and we could help people obtain in a more professional Manner. So we started kind of brainstorming on how we could do that. And uh, this is the first point I want to bring up. When you're looking for an opportunity, business opportunities, pay attention to what you pay other people to do that you think you could do better. Right? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. If you pay somebody to do something and you think, gosh, that was a lot of money for a poor quality product. There's maybe some opportunity there. And that's what happened with us. And so we started brainstorming. We said, well, we don't have any money. Neither of us had any money. So how can we start this business with no advertising money, no upfront capital? We have to bootstrap this business, which means we, we're not taking out a loan. We're not doing anything. How do we do this? And so we started thinking and brainstorming. And one of the things we, we decided is we were going to work with retailers in, in the area, stores that already had built-in customers, but that might have shared the same interest in the certifications that we were teaching. So we would go to these and we would say, hey, you've got these customers coming in your door. What if we offered an event at your store where we would help people get X, Y, or Z certification? They would attend the class actually in your store. You guys would advertise it all and we'll keep all the money. And amazingly enough, the businesses said, okay, great, let's do it. And so we were able to get our foot in the door at a very small retailer in far west Utah that would let us start teaching these classes there. First class we taught, I remember it had like nine people. Between me and my brother, we netted like $400. I remember thinking, this is fantastic. We have struck it rich, this is great. You know, we just each made $200, things are going awesome. And what we started doing is offering a product that was better than what other people. We weren't reinventing anything. We were teaching the same certification classes that have been around for decades. But we were doing it better. More professional package. People felt more comfortable taking it in that retail environment than they did at their house. So we repackaged a product that was already existing and, and sold it. And uh, what happened is other retailers started contacting us and saying, hey, we like the idea. Why don't you come? in our retail store, why don't you come with us? And so we started doing that and we started growing and that's how the expansion kind of happened. Uh, as, as time went on, we grew more and more and more. I remember one of my favorite days was uh, when we got our first office. It was so excited. 
Go see our first office. Can't see the picture very well, but it's nine feet by 11 feet was the office. We were paying $110 a month for it. I was so excited. We had our own office. It's fantastic. Uh, and, and the business started growing. Now, I want to kind of backtrack a little bit because you know the end of the story, you know the beginning, but I want to kind of talk about how we got to the end from the beginning. So I have some, some simple principles that I live by. Uh, and I believe these are good business principles, especially for anybody starting a small business. And when I say small business, the SBA defines small businesses as anybody that has employees of 500 or less. That's pretty big. 500 employees is pretty big. So when I'm saying small business tonight, I'm talking about the 5, 10, 15 employee businesses that, that most people are going to start, especially college students. That's, that's the average small business. So, these are some, some principles that I live and die by uh, in any business. First is I avoid any form of debt. Uh, when we started our business, we said in no way, shape, or form are we going to take on any debt. Why would it have been a bad idea for me to take on debt? Why didn't I go get a $40,000 SBA loan, open a big office? Yeah, right? Interest is, is what he said, and that's fantastic. We didn't have the money. Well, I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, if you can't pay the bills at the beginning, right? Then that's probably a bad sign. So exactly his point. He said it snowballs. And we just couldn't afford to take on any debt. So we didn't take out any debt on necessity, but also on principle. Uh, I, I do a lot of business entity formation work in my law practice. I see a lot of good business ideas that die because the people that start the business go take out a big loan, they get a big fancy office downtown, they're paying three, four thousand dollars a month on a lease for their office, they buy all their office supplies. We didn't do any of that. And I would strongly encourage you to avoid that in any form. And that also carries over into your personal life. Uh, I think debt is absolutely a horrible thing uh, in any way, shape, or form. So one of my goals, one of the reasons that I started my business is I wasn't going to take out any student loans. That was my kind of thing I said I'm not going to do. Now I realize people have to. So I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't take out student loans. People have to. But some people don't have to, and I didn't have to. I was able-bodied, and I was able to work, and I said I can go to work. And so I worked, and I paid my way through school, and, and that includes law school. I never took out any student loans. Uh, during law school, I worked in the law library, I was making like $8 an hour, so during, in between classes I'd go work in the law library, I'd sit there and do my homework. And then I got a prosecuting contract uh, at the, in a city there. My third year of law school I was able to get it, it was a miracle, the other person competing for the contract dropped out, I wasn't even an attorney. And they gave me the prosecuting contract for two cities, and so I did that, and then I ran my business. And when I say ran my business, you'll see down here one of my principles is work. Um, during law school, I went to law school at uh, University of Idaho, northern Idaho up there, uh, not far from Spokane, Washington, actually across the border, about an hour and a half. And during law school, I ran my business as well. And we, I mentioned we were, we were operating in 17 states. Well, I couldn't afford, as I was growing the business, because I didn't want to take on any debt, I couldn't afford to pay other people to teach these classes. So when I had a class in Des Moines, Iowa, that I was teaching, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I had to teach that class. And so what that meant is, I would go to my law school classes Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then Wednesday night, I'd take a red-eye flight out of Spokane, and I'd fly all night to somewhere like Pittsburgh. Okay? And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I would work. I'd teach seminars in that, in that area. And then I would fly back Saturday night on a red-eye, see my wife, and my two kids on Sunday, and then uh, start class again Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I did that for three years during law school, so I missed about 50% of my law school classes. But that's what I needed to do to not take out the debt. So again, it's something you have to, you have to work for, but that's a principle I live and die by. Uh, second one, avoid any sense of entitlement. How's entitlement different than debt? Are those synonyms? Yeah, right? The, the sense of entitlement is what I mean. When you're starting a business, uh, it is nearly impossible for you to survive if you feel like it's just going to happen because you deserve it. Uh, people will try and rip you off. People will take every advantage they can. And nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, very few people on this planet are going to give you money because they like you, but you don't have a good product. 
Okay, so the entitlement, the sense of entitlement that I've worked hard enough, I deserve this, it should just happen on its own, is very dangerous. So you have to avoid that as well. And then my third principle here, know your ROI. What does ROI stand for? Return on investment, exactly. And I don't mean that in, the, uh, in just the financial sense. I mean that in, the, in every sense. Know what you're going to get out of the amount of energy you're going to exert to get it, right? What is it? Is the benefit outweigh the cost? And so in any business, in our business particularly, a lot of the certification classes that we would try and teach, people just didn't want to attend. They were great, they were great classes, but people just didn't want to attend them, so there was no money there. So it wasn't worth us uh, dumping money into it. And that's again, when I get to the point down here, when necessary, cut your losses. Uh, a lot of times you have a great business idea, you think it's fantastic, nobody wants to buy it, nobody wants to pay you for it, and so you need to know when to, uh, to cut your losses. So again, a lot of these principles are, are things that I, I found that were necessary. And I'm going to talk about the innovation one here in a, in a minute. Now, I mentioned the growing years. We had our tiny office. <coughs> this is our board. I wish you could see it a little bit better, but this is how we did our scheduling. Uh, each of these little piece of paper here is a different city in a different state, and it was the dates that we had to be in those cities. This is, you know, kind of before the iPad time when you could just sync your calendars and, and make it work nice. Uh, but that's how we did it. That's all we could do. And so it was very crucial that we didn't have the same date for different cities. And so again, just doing it. It didn't take, uh, it didn't take a fancy office or a fancy headquarters, but just doing the work uh, yourself. And I, I look at that board, we'd stare at that board for hours trying to figure out how we could link cities together and, and do it. So the SBA put out some, some studies here, and this is actually from 2011. It was the last time they did this. And uh, this is published again by the SBA, which is Small Business Administration. And they listed some of the top reasons that small businesses fail. And I thought this was really interesting. First off, they said insufficient capital. Uh, the report said it's important to ascertain how much money your business will require and that's not only the cost of starting the business. Knowing what to price your product as. If you're selling uh, shoes, if you're selling handbags, or if you're selling a service, right? you're, you're mowing lawns, you're cleaning windows, you need to know what the cost of that product is, not only to, to produce, right? how much does it cost to produce the shoes, but also how much does it cost to acquire each customer? How much money are you spending by the time that customer pays you money? And I'll tell you, in my, in my professional life, one of the top reasons besides debt that I've seen businesses fail is they don't know how to properly price their product. They either price it too high that the market won't pay them for it, or they price it too low and they don't even realize they're losing money every time they perform a service. I had a plumber, a client of mine, he's a plumber, and he was pricing his services so low uh, that, that he was actually losing money. Every time he'd go fix a toilet, he was losing money to do that. It was costing him more money to fix the person's toilet than he was making by charging them. And I told him that. I said, hey, you're charging too little. You need to be charging more money. And he says, well, it's a service. It doesn't cost me anything to go fix somebody's toilet. It's my time is all it costs. I said, well, you're not thinking about the cost of acquiring that customer. How much are you spending in advertising? The travel to get there, your time is money as well. So again, pricing your product, you need to know not only how much capital you're going to need to run your business, but also to start the business and to, to, uh, to price your products. Location, right? you got to be selling the right product in the right location. Uh, different demographics like different things. Right? There's a reason that we don't have Dolce & Gabbana stores on college campuses, right? because college students aren't going to buy that product. Uh, you sell low-cost products to people who have little money. High-cost products, people have lots of money, right? And so you need to know what, where to sell your product and, and what product to sell. Again, lack of general planning, not knowing uh, the time to grow or, or how to grow or even what products to, to sell. And then overexpansion. How can overexpansion hurt a business? Overexpansion generally means, right, you're... 
you're doing well, your business is doing great, and you say it's time to grow. I've got one nail salon that's making a lot of money, so I'm going to put another nail salon in a different city. Right? How can overexpansion hurt you? You don't, have the, you don't have the resources. Yep. That was a big problem with, with me. When we first started growing, I said, okay, we've got a system that works. We've got a formula. Right? A plus B equals C. But a big component of that was I was flying all over the country teaching those classes, right? So it depended on me. It was hard to find another me. And that's not because I'm special. It's because I had a vested interest in the business. You'll find that as well. If you start a business, you'll find it's very hard to find anybody who cares at all about your business remotely as much as you care about your business, right? And it makes sense. They don't have a vested interest in it. They're not taking home all the money. They're getting paid their salary. They're going home, and they're not thinking about that business again. So, again, exactly right. You need to find the right people to expand. So expanding too quickly can, uh, can be death to a business as well. So those are, those are some of the reasons, and I found that pretty insightful for why uh, that happens. This picture, I, I wish you could see this a little bit better. This was the early days when we would teach our seminars. We'd fly into a city, and I'd get a rental car. I'd get the cheapest rental car, the little tiny, you know, whatever those are, and, uh, you know, the Prius or that type of car, $12 a day. But then we would have to take these folding chairs to the seminars with us. And so uh, this picture here, I have 65 folding chairs in my rental car. And this one, this is my favorite, and I, I wish you could see it better, 72 folding chairs in my rental car with me as I'm driving. And I'm not driving just a little ways. I'm driving four and a half, five hours uh, across the state of Iowa with 70-some-odd uh, folding chairs in my car. And the reason I tell you that is it's not pretty. You know, running your own business is not a glamorous type of affair. If you're going to grow it, some people just hit dynamite and it, and it blows up overnight and you've got the Facebook idea and all of a sudden you're worth billions. But most people, it's ugly. You're not, uh, you're trying to cut costs wherever you can so that you can stay in business and it's, it's not all that glamorous. So Thomas Edison's quote that genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, I think is, is very true. So the reason a lot of businesses will succeed is, is they'll work hard enough for it. And then finally, like I said, when it does happen, it feels fantastic. You know, when this was, this was a class we were teaching in Cedar Falls, Iowa, and we planned on having about 30 people show up that night. We had 300 show up that night, uh, which was fantastic. You know, you start seeing that your product is selling, and it's a fantastic feeling. So I, I fully encourage you to, to, if you've got that entrepreneurial spirit, if that's something you want to do, I love teaching at Salt Lake Community College because I've got so many in my business classes, so many students will come up to me after class and say, I've got this idea for a business. And, uh, you know, I want to do this, or I want to start this business. Some of them have fantastic ideas, uh, incredible inventions, and I almost want to tell them, don't tell me these, don't tell anybody these, <laughs> to them on your own, uh, but I love to hear them. And so if you've got that drive, I, I highly encourage you to go after it, but go after it the right way. Like I said, avoiding, avoiding any debt whenever you can, bootstrapping the business, and maybe it succeeds, maybe it doesn't, but I can tell you the satisfaction that I got from growing a business from nothing to being able to ultimately sell it to a, to a nationwide firm uh, and see that business grow and still today seeing that business be a national brand. and I love it. It's a fantastic feeling. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite stories... I don't know if anybody watches the UFC, Ultimate Fighting Championship, the fights, uh, but the UFC was purchased, and I'm going to get these numbers wrong, so don't quote me on this, but it was back in like 2010, the UFC was bankrupt, and uh, they were purchased by Dana White and the Fertitta brothers for, I believe, $10.5 million, and the guy who'd previously ran it uh, lived in Florida, I believe, and they interviewed him. Uh, a couple years ago, and they said, you know, now the UFC is worth so many billions of dollars. Do you regret selling it for ten and a half million or whatever it was? And I loved his response. He just looked at him and said, no, I sold it for ten and a half million. It's awesome. <laughs> sold a business for ten and a half million. It's a guy who started this business in his garage, grew it to the point where he sold it for ten and a half million. It's fantastic, right? It's everybody's dream. 
So he said, I wasn't going to get it to the billion dollar stage. And I knew that with my business. I wasn't going to get it to the billion dollar stage. And, uh, and so knowing when to hold them and when to fold them and when to cut your losses is, is also a, a big point in succeeding. So questions I get from my students all the time, things like what type of entity, how do you start a business, that type of stuff. And so I've got a great resource. Um, Salt Lake Community College actually has a great resource. And I've got her card here. It is Beth Colosimo, and she is over at the, on the uh, Miller campus, and she runs the business services division there. And what they have is they have a, well, Jim, what's the name of it? The incubator. The incubator there, and it's the business incubator. And what it is essentially for is for people that want to start a business, have questions, want to get answers. Uh, you know, what do I do? Do I operate as a sole proprietorship? Do I operate as an LLC? Uh, what do I do? And I think it's a fantastic service. I'm going to get in touch with Beth and go over and actually offer whatever I can as far as legal advice uh, and helping students do that. So, oh, you did? That's awesome. Where'd you Where'd you get it from? At Sportsman's Warehouse. So yeah, he was one of the one of the students that took our class. Yeah, it may have been. Yeah, we by the time we were done, and that was one of the divisions that we had was this uh, legal heat is what we called it was the name of it, and it was a firearm training division. We did a lot of law enforcement, a lot of civilian training, and and uh, that's great. That's, I get stopped from time to time. People, we had a we had a book, we had an app, uh, a lot of different stuff for people to use. So people will stop and say, "Hey, I got that app and whatnot." So that's that's great to hear. I'm glad to hear that. Question was when you're starting a business. And there's a lot of paperwork. How do you do that? Do you do it on your own? Can you do it on your own? Do you need to reach out to somebody? So first of all, yes, you can absolutely do it on your own. Uh, matter of fact, Utah makes it very easy to start a business. Uh, you can form an LLC. Now, for 99% of people that are starting a business, I tell them start an LLC, limited liability company. The reason you have an LLC is because it provides you with limited liability, like it talks about. Uh, a lot of people, when they start their business, they don't form any type of a business, so they'll just start, for example, mowing lawns. Right? They charge $20 a lawn, they just start mowing lawns. What they don't realize is they have started a business. They're in a sole proprietorship. Okay? Even though they don't have a name, they haven't filed anything with the state, they are a business. It's Phil Nelson Lawn Mowing. I'm a guy who mows lawns. So if I, for example, were to run over something with my lawnmower, or get in a car accident on the way to mow somebody's lawn, I am individually liable for any harm and takes my home from me, right? takes my car. So unlimited liability when you're a sole proprietor. Now, if you form an LLC, a limited liability company, your liability is generally limited to what the company owns. So Phil's Lawn Mowing Service, LLC, can only be sued for my three lawnmowers and however much is in my bank account that month. So they can't take my house, they can't take my, you know, my cars, that type of stuff. So starting an LLC in Utah, incredibly easy. You can go to the Utah Department of Commerce, Secretary of State's website, and they will walk you through the process of choosing a name for your company and forming the LLC and it takes about 10 minutes to form an LLC in Utah. $70 is the cost, and uh, it'll walk you through the entire process. If you just Google form an LLC in Utah, it's one of the top, uh, it's one of the top choices that'll come up, but make sure it's the state's website, not some company or law firm's website. Uh, paying a law firm to do it for you on the cheap end, forming an LLC, $300 on the high end, two, three thousand dollars. So it's something you can absolutely do on your own. Uh, as you grow, as you get more complicated, as you're bringing in, you know, shareholders and you've got members investing, then you may want to retain an attorney. But in the beginning, it's very easy. Uh, I just highly recommend starting an LLC. Yeah, absolutely. When you do it on the state, he said, can you add members to the LLC? When you do it on the state's website, it prints you out some very basic articles of organization. You've got some very simple, the member is Phil Nelson, the agent is Phil Nelson, and here's his address. As you go along and you start getting more complex and your, thing, your business is doing well, then absolutely hire an attorney, pay him to, to get you some good uh, articles drafted, and they'll be able to add members, shell, uh, sell shares, bring in investors, that type of stuff. Oh yeah, great question. He said, what about the books? Uh, that was a huge, problem for us and 
One of the mistakes we made is we did our own accounting. Uh, we bought QuickBooks and we did our own. <coughs> and when you're trying to sell a company, you should start a company with the idea that someday somebody's going to buy this from you. When you're trying to sell a company, they want to see your books from the beginning. And they're going to audit them. Right? They want audited financials. And in the beginning, our books were less than stellar. You know, it was just us. We'd never done it before. We're trying to keep track of every transaction. And it just wasn't great. It actually ended up costing us quite a bit on the purchase price because they had to exempt a lot of our income because it wasn't, it wasn't that we weren't reporting it or paying tax or anything like that. It's just that in the books itself, it wasn't properly uh, recorded. So they had to exempt. So it ended up costing us a lot on what we sold our company for. So in the beginning, again, cost benefit, right? If, you're gonna, if you've got money to pay an accountant, if you can trade services with a CPA to come do your books, fantastic. We couldn't do that, so that's what we had to do. We had to do our own. Uh, but I, I always, I opt for the professional on that because that still hurts me a little bit that we sold for less because of that. That's a great question. She said, is there ever anybody that you would 100% say get this done professionally? Um, you know, it depends on the industry. I, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, is you've got to know the rules for the game you're playing. So if you're going into an industry, for example, here in Utah, in order to braid somebody's hair for money, you have to have a license to do that. You have to go get a license from the state to do that. So not knowing the rules ahead of time can absolutely cost you later on. So depending on the industry I'm going into, if I'm going into an industry that I don't necessarily understand, a food truck, for example. Food truck's are pretty popular. I got a lot of college students come up to me and say, I'm going to start a food truck. I say, fantastic. I think food trucks are awesome. I had an idea to start a food truck 10 years ago. I wish I would have done it. I'd have been the first one. I'd have invented the food trucks. Would have been awesome. Uh, but in order to do that, it's more complicated than you realize. You have to have a commercial kitchen to operate your uh, food truck. Even if you just got a food truck, you don't ever have a brick and mortar restaurant, you have to make all your food in a commercial kitchen in order to do that. And so in order to get the permits to be in the city, so again, depending on the industry, I would go to an attorney and say, what do I need to know for this industry before I start my business? It's going to cost you three, four, five hundred dollars, but I equate it to doing a home inspection on a house before you buy it. And before I buy a house, I get those guys that come in with the infrared scanners and look through the walls to tell me what's on the inside of every wall because you need to know what you're getting into before you make that investment. So, yeah, depending on the industry, I absolutely would go to an attorney. Now, as far as uh, accountants, taxes are a huge thing. If you don't know how to do your taxes properly for a business, uh, it can devastate you when you get a letter from the IRS saying you owe $24,000, right? And, and they start garnishing wages. So I'm a big one. I love the idea behind TurboTax, but I'm a big one on having a professional do my taxes so that I don't get a letter later on saying, you know, how much I owe. So that's another one. Great, great question. He said, if you've got an idea, but it's kind of a big box idea, would you suggest starting small and growing it? Or uh, I am huge on if it's going to succeed on a macro level, it's usually going to succeed on a micro level. So if it doesn't work on a micro level, I'm hesitant to take a macro. Right? I don't want to take an idea that doesn't work on a small scale, big scale. So I am absolutely a believer on starting the idea on a small level, what you can do right now, what you can do without overextending yourself right now, and, uh, and growing it. Bootstrap business, right? If you've ever read the book Bootstrap Business, fantastic book. So yeah, I would start small, grow it, and then once it gets to that macro scale, then life's great. He's, they said, I never finished the story of my wife. Let me give you the happy ending to that story. So uh, we go down to Huntsman Cancer Institute, and it was about a year to a year and a half, we go through the process, and then they finally give us the news that she's cancer-free. And so then, once that happens, if anybody's ever been through that process, it's not really the end of the story. You have to go back every month, and I think it's and then every month, and then every six months, and then every year, and now we're to the every year scale. So it's been uh, six, seven years since we've been in the clear, 
and we're going back every year. So yeah, she said, you're starting a business, you got a million things to do at once, right? The, the, the crazy thing about starting a business is you are every department. Look at a company like Coca-Cola, they got a marketing department, they got an accounting department, they got a legal department, they got HR, right? You don't think you need an HR when you're starting a business by yourself, but you will need an HR. You need to resolve your, the issues you have. So you have, to, you have to wear all those hats, right? You've got to be the accountant. You've got to be the marketer. You've got to be the, the production line, everything. So how do you prioritize? And I'll tell you, it's hard, um, especially if you've got a family, right? I, I mean, I tell you what, flying out of state every week for three years while I was a law student with a wife and young kid, uh, my wife's a very patient, patient, it's, it's hard. So how do you prioritize? The first thing I always concentrated on is, is it going to make money? Right, so is, is the task that I'm focusing on right now going to make me money? And if it's not going to make me money, then it better be very important. Right? If it's not going to return an investment very quickly, I need that. I'm a startup business. I need to make money right now so that I can grow this business, right? I need $1,000 next month so that I can place an ad on X, Y, or Z website to sell my product, and I need that money now, so what can I do now? I need to turn cash. So that's usually what I would, I would look at. And I, I keep, a lot of times in my class, my students think I'm obsessed with mowing lawns, because I always talk about mowing lawns. So if you need a job, go mow lawns. I've got a client who lives in a 9,000 square foot house uh, unbelievable house, indoor basketball court, uh, very, very well off. Wakes up every morning, and goes and mows lawns. That's what he does for a living, he mows lawns. Now he mows a lot of lawns. He's got a lot of people mowing lawns for him. But that's, that's what he does. I mean, that's the, so it doesn't have to be that complicated. A lot of app developer clients. Man, apps are fantastic. Uh, what I love about apps, and I had an app, and I still, the, the app's still around. They pay you money while you sleep. People are buying it in... Bangladesh while you're sleeping, and it's awesome. So again, if it's finding ways to quickly result in, in return on investment, right? As a small business owner, you're not planting seeds that you're hoping are gonna grow next year. You are picking, right? So you're picking the low picking fruit so that you can survive. And so that's, again, it's, it's, it's hard to, to give some good functional advice on that, but you just have to find a way to say, okay, Right now, the accounting, like I mentioned, has to go on the back burner because the sales department needs some focus. So that's the hat I gotta wear right now. So, sorry, it's hard. Yeah, so great. If, you're, if you are actually going to get money to start up your business, the SBA, will, the Small Business Administration, will have, they, they offer lending specifically for small businesses. So if you were gonna open, you know, a, a nail salon or, or a, or a barber shop, and you needed startup to, <clears throat> to actually build out the, the retail store. They will do that, but they will require a business plan from you. And you will probably need somebody's help doing that. Those are fairly complicated, so you can go. Now, they have resources there. The SBA actually has resources, so in Salt Lake, you can go to the SBA, and they can set you up with resources for how to draft that plan. Um, but it is more complicated than most people do on their own. So yeah, I would, of course, now, just a business plan for you to get going, absolutely. You know, get a whiteboard, draw out how you're gonna do it, uh, but when you're actually putting it on paper and you're coming up with a formal proposal, a prospectus, that type of stuff, you need usually some help to do that. So I would contact the SBA and see what they can set you up with. Okay, well I appreciate you letting me come and talk to you. I'm, uh, my contact information I'm gonna put up here on the board and I'll be, out, I'll be here after if anybody has any questions, but I appreciate it and thanks for letting me come and talk to you.